Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, well, welcome to uh, this course on shared memory programming with OpenMP. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Mark Bull. I'm a senior researcher at EPCC. I have interests in parallel algorithms, parallel programming models, uh, benchmarking, and novel uses of high performance computing. Um, I teach on our master's program in, in high performance computing, uh, and I'm also a representative on the OpenMP ARB, which is the body that administers the, the OpenMP standard. So this course is going to be split across four weeks. So this week I'm going to cover some of the basic concepts in shared memory programming. Uh, and then move on to cover the fun, some fundamentals about OpenMP. And uh, week two, we'll talk about parallel regions, which are the basic parallel construct in OpenMP, uh, and also about work sharing, which is how OpenMP handles parallel loops, which, which are very important. The third week, we'll talk more about synchronization uh, and some other topics such as nested parallelism. Uh, and then the final week, we'll talk about some basically tips and tricks for practical use of OpenMP, uh, and then also about performance issues and, and how to deal with those. So each session is going to run from uh, about 2 o'clock to 4.30. I'll have around uh, a 30-minute break in between, the, in between the two lectures uh, um, in, in each week. Okay, so to find the, uh, the lecture notes um, and all the materials for this course, uh, the easiest thing to do is to go to the Archer training web page uh, and follow the links for this course from there. Okay, so we're offering access to participants to our uh, cluster called Cirrus. Uh, for you to do the uh, practical exercises in, in your own time, if you'd like. Um, so we'll give you guest accounts for the course. You've already had details of how to apply from those. Um, so they'll remain active until till the end of December. Um, if you haven't already registered, please please do so if you'd like to. So the idea is that you can work on the practical exercises in, in your own time. Uh, and if you have problems, please post on the course chat page. So follow the link from the course web page. Um, so either myself or one of my colleagues will be monitoring this regularly and trying to answer questions. But please feel free to help each other out. If you uh, you know if you see a question you and you and you know the answer, please please feel free to help out other people on the on the course. So the full instructions for the exercises are, are in the exercise sheet on, on the course web page. Um, but if there's anything that's, uh, that's not clear or that uh, you'd like some additional explanation for, again, please, please post on the chat page and uh, can follow that up for you. OK. So just practical stuff. To log on to Cirrus, you'll be given a guest account ID. Um, so uh, if you're on Linux or Mac, you can use SSH to uh, to access uh, the uh, access and log into Cirrus. Um, for Windows users, we recommend that you install MobaX Term application. Um, and there's some details on the course page as to how to do that if you haven't done that already. Okay, and then once you're on on the uh, on the on the machine, then you can access the uh, the um, practical exercises with the with the following commands. I think there might be a typo on there which I need to fix. Um, so I'll send that round on the uh, on the course chat page. Okay, so uh, let's let's get started with the with the first lecture, which is uh, concepts of uh, shared memory programming. 
So I'm going to, to begin with, I'm going to say a little bit about hardware, just to, so that we, uh, we all understand the type of system that we're targeting with, with uh, OpenMP. And then I'm going to talk about the basic concepts in, in, in threaded programming. So these concepts apply more widely than just OpenMP. They apply to other uh, multi-threaded programming interfaces like POSIX threads or C++ threads. Um, and then later on this afternoon, we'll talk more specifically how those apply to OpenMP. Okay, so the type of hardware that we're targeting here are shared memory systems. So threaded programming is most often used on shared memory parallel computers. So the concept here is, uh, is quite straightforward in the sense that a shared memory computer consists of another pro a number of processing units, so call them CPUs or cores, together with some memory. But the key feature of these systems is that there is a single address space across the whole memory system. So what does that mean? That means that every CPU or core is able to read and write all the memory locations in the system. So the hardware supports one logical memory space and all the CPUs or cores refer to a memory location using the same address. So the simple conceptual model that we have in mind when we're programming these systems is that we have a collection of processors and we have a single global shared memory and all the processors are connected somehow to that memory and they're all able to read and write memory locations. In practice, of course, real hardware is much more complicated than this. Um, the, the memory itself may be split into multiple smaller units. There will typically always be multiple levels of cache memory present. So these are fast, small cache memories which sit between the processor and main memory and contain copies of memory addresses for fast reaccess. Some of those levels may be shared between some sites of the processors. And then the interconnect itself might have a more complex topology. But regardless of all this, the single address space is still supported. So the model that the hardware presents to the programmer is simply that of a bunch of processors all connected to the same memory. So all this hardware complexity uh, can affect the performance of a program, but not their correctness, but not the correctness of the program. So it uh, doesn't matter about the hardware guarantees that, that the, the programming model is supported correctly. The subtleties of the hardware design can have some impacts and performance and we'll talk a little bit about some of those issues in, uh, in week four. Okay, so just to illustrate some of, some of the, uh, the complexity here, this is still very, very simplified, but here for example, so I've shown that instead of having one memory, the, the memory is actually split into two parts each of those parts is probably in practice associated with a socket containing a chip. Each chip may contain multiple cores. Each core might have its own, for example, what I've shown here is each core might have its own level one cache memory. Um, multiple cores might share level two cache memory. Uh, on a lot of modern systems, in fact, there's three levels of cache. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of complexity here in the hardware design, but, and you know, the interconnect may be, may be more complicated somehow, but nevertheless, the simple model is still supported 
in that every processor is able to read and write all the locations in main memory. So that's the idea about the hardware. The threaded programming model is um, a abstract model for, for programming these devices. Um, and it's based on the notion of threads. So threads are like processes, um, except that, that threads can share memory with each other. So by default, if you have multiple processes running on a system, then each process is, has its own memory and is unable to access memory belonging to other processes. So th threads are different in the sense that a, a group of threads uh, are able to, uh, and naturally by default, share memory with each other, as well as having their own private memory. So in this model, we have two types of data. There is some shared data that can be accessed by all the threads. Uh, and there is private data. So every thread has its own private data, which can only be accessed by the owning thread. Um, it's reasonably important to realize that this is a soft, this distinction between shared data and private data is to almost to a large extent, it's a software construct. So the hardware underneath, the memory that stores this data is the same. Okay? But it, this, is a, this is a software uh, level construct that allows some data to be shared between threads and other data to be private to its owning thread. So in order to do useful parallel computation, different threads can follow different flows of control through the same program. So typically all threads are, will be running the same executable, but they can take different paths through it and therefore execute different computations. So another way of, of saying that is that each thread has its own program counter. So each thread has its own independent notion of which, which, which instruction in the program to execute next and they are independent of each other. Usually when for performance reasons, we usually think about having a one-to-one -one mapping between threads and the hardware execution units. So uh, the, the, the normal arrangement is to, try and, is to try and arrange to have exactly one thread running per CPU core. Don't have to do that. Uh, it could be more. Um, and so you know, it's perfectly okay. The operating system can handle many more threads running than there are physical hardware resources, uh, and it will timeshare the, uh, the the cores between between all the running threads. Um, typically, that turns out to be an inefficient way of running programs. Uh, and in the HPC world, we tend to try and avoid that situation. It's also possible and quite common on modern processors to have some hardware support for running multiple threads per core efficiently. So this is, for example, what Intel calls hyperthreading, or more generally is called simultaneous multi-threading. So this is where there is some additional support in the hardware that efficiently allows more than one thread. So typically two, maybe, maybe four in some hardware designs um, to execute concurrently on, on the same core without having the operating system involved in, in scheduling them. For some types of application that might be beneficial, for a lot of HPC applications, it actually isn't. It's the, still the optimal situation is to run a single thread per core. And uh, a lot of HPC systems are set up in such a way that 
um, the, the, hype, the hyper thing or simultaneous multi-threading is disabled by default at least, okay? Some, some systems just disable it entirely. Uh, other systems tend to only enable it if you actually ask for it explicitly. Depends on, depends on how the system is run and managed. If you're running um, OpenMP or other multi-threaded programs on your own uh, laptop or desktop system, then typically those hyper-threads will be enabled, um, but it's in, and your hardware might like to pretend to you that it has more, more physical cores than it really has. So if you ask your laptop how many cores I've got, it might say eight, but in fact, you've got four physical cores, each with two hyper threads. Um, so, and you just need to be aware of that. And you might, your OpenMP compiler might run eight threads by default, which may not be optimal if you only have four physical cores, for example. Okay, and so just uh, uh, an illustration of this this idea. So, have uh, I'm showing the, this picture. We have three threads, um, so each thread has its own program counter and its own private data, but all the threads have access to some common shared data, which is how threads can cooperate and and communicate data between them. So let me say a little bit more about thread communication, because in order to have useful parallel programs, threads must be able to exchange data with each other. And in this, in this model, threads communicate with each other by reading and writing shared data. Um, so if thread one wants to communicate a value to thread two, thread one can write a value to some shared variable, uh, let's call it A, and then at some point later, thread two can read the value from that same shared variable A. So just as a contrast for anybody who's done some uh, message passing program with MPI, for example, um, this is where the model is fundamentally different because there's no notion of messages in the threaded programming model. Um, it's all about, communication is all about uh, reading and writing shared data. So there's no, no, no notion of explicit messages, sending explicit messages between threads. Okay. So just to walk through a little animation to illustrate this idea, so here I have two threads. So thread one, the green thread, thread two, the red thread. Um, each thread has its own private data uh, and they both have access to the, the shared data at the bottom. So to do a, a simple exchange of, of, val of a value between the two threads, what might happen is that the first thing that happens is that thread one uh, assigns a value, in this case 23, to a variable called my a, which happens to live in its private data space. And when we come along to talk about OpenMP specifically, then we'll then we'll address the issue of you know, how do we determine whether uh, variables are are private or shared. Okay, but I'll gloss over that for the minute. So my A lives in, in thread one's private data, so it gets the value 23 in there. Thread one could then assign and copy that value into a shared variable called A, which happens to live in the shared data space. Again, well, not discuss the details of how we arrange that at this point. And then at some point later, thread two might read 
the value from the shared variable A, uh, and then it might do some computation with it, and it can store uh, a value in its own private copy, in its own private variable, my A. So you can see clearly here that there are these two types of data. So if my A is a private variable, then each thread has its own copy and they can have different values in, in that variable. If, uh, whereas for A, which is a shared variable, there's only one copy which all the threads have access to uh, and it only has one, it has a given value at any, any one time. So I've suggested here that this communication can happen, but correct, the, correct of, the, the correct evaluation of that communication is reliant on thread to reading shared variable after thread one wrote it. And the problem here is that we have to make sure we can arrange that somehow because by default, the threads execute asynchronously. So each thread proceeds through its program instructions independently of other threads. So this means that we somehow need to ensure that actions on shared variables occur in the correct order. So in that previous example, you know, we have to make sure that thread one writes, really does write variable A before thread two reads it. But sometimes we want the other, the other way around because we tend to use, uh, reuse memory locations. So we might want, for example, that thread one should read the old value from, from, from A before thread two write something new into it. So we might, might have, there may be other, other cases that we want to take care of like that. Um, so it's also important to remember that uh, if we, if a thread tries to update shared variable, so for example, if, it, if, if a thread tries to perform an action on a shared variable A, it's like, uh, like adding one to it, then that kind of operation where, where a variable is, is read, modified, and written again, that is not atomic by default. And what does that mean? It means that if true threads try to do that at the same time without any synchronization, one of the updates may get overwritten. Um, so I'd just like to try and illustrate uh, how, that, how that happens. So now I'm kind of really thinking about how the threads are actually executing on the hardware here. So now um, I'm so I'm imagining that I have my two threads again, but they are executing on separate cores. Uh, and each core has its own CPU registers. So this is the storage inside the processor where the processor actually takes values from to do arithmetic operations. So I have two different threads executing on two different cores those will be using different sets of CPU registers. And so logically, they will, both threads have access to main memory. So if both threads try to add one to a value that's in main memory without any synchronization, then things can go wrong. Uh, and the way, this, the way that things can go wrong is, is, is like this. Because in order to be able to add one to a value, then at least three separate things have to happen. The thread has to load the value from memory into registers, has to perform the addition, which will write the results of that addition into the registers, and then it has to store the value from the registers back into memory again. So let's see what might, might happen. So I have two threads, 
the initial value of this variable is 10. They both try to add one to it. So first thing might happen is that thread one loads the value into, into registers. And then thread two also loads the value. Then thread one does the addition. So it's the new value in registers becomes 11. Thread two does the same thing. Then thread one stores the value back into memory again. And you can now probably see what's going to go wrong. Thread two also stores its value back into memory. So we started out with the value 10. Two threads added one to it, and we got the value 11. So that's not what we wanted. Even worse than that, we don't know what order those instructions are going to be interleaved in in time. So it could be that uh, if you ran the program again, thread one might complete all its instructions first. So then thread two would indeed load the value of 11 from memory and add one to it and you might get the value 12. So without the correct synchronization, this type of multi-threaded program uh, has non-deterministic behavior. So that means that you can run the program several times and you get different results. So this kind of problem is called a race condition. Um, so the, the idea is that you have multiple threads which are racing to do uh, some actions and we don't know which one is going to win. Okay? Don't know what order these actions are going to happen in. So without, uh, without doing something special in terms of synchronization, then what we have is an incorrect program with a race condition bug in it. And these are particularly nasty because of the non-deterministic behavior. We can end up writing programs that you, know, you can run it 99 times and you get the correct answer. You run it 100th time and you get the wrong answer. So it makes software testing difficult, harder, in than testing sequential code. Um, so it's very important that we try our best to avoid this, this kind of behavior by thinking very carefully about how threads need to synchronize with each other. Okay, so that's us covered the ideas of threads, the ideas of shared and private data, uh, the way threads communicate with each other, and the need for threads to synchronize with each other if they want, if we want them to exchange values safely uh, and in a way that's that's not going to produce one of these uh, non-deterministic behavior bugs. So there's a couple of more concepts that I, I, I want to cover in, in, in this first session. Um, so the first of these is tasks. So a, a task is just a, a piece of computation which can be executed independently of, of other tasks. So the whole uh, idea and, and uh, concept behind parallel programming is to try and break down our computation into multiple tasks that can be executed uh, at, this, at the same time. So in principle, we could create a new thread to execute every task. Okay? So we could uh, have a one-to-one -one mapping between the independent pieces of computation uh, and the threads. So that's, that's a, a logical, consistent, and sensible model. But in practice, that doesn't work out because the actual act of creating threads on the system uh, 
uh, is not is not cheap. Okay, so if we have lots and lots of small tasks, uh, we try to create a thread for every task um, that can become too expensive. Yeah, and we also might exist. We might end we might easily end up in in a situation where we have many many more threads than we have physical execution units. Um, so I already mentioned this idea that we want to restrict the number of threads to be equal to the number of cores, or maybe equal to the number of hardware threads. So instead, what we can do is we can have this separation of concerns. Okay, so we have this idea of breaking computation down into tasks, but instead of creating a new thread to execute each task, we create a pre-existing pool of threads and then tasks can be executed by those. So the idea here is that tasks are, are submitted to the pool of threads. Some thread in the pool will execute the task. Um, maybe as a programmer, we don't have any control over that, but maybe we don't care. Uh, and then at some point in the future, we have some guarantee that the task is guaranteed to, to have completed. So this idea of breaking down our computation into, into independent tasks uh, and then mapping those onto threads in, in some way. So in addition to this idea, we might also have some ordering constraints between tasks. So, you know, one task might produce a result which is needed by another task. So that means there is some ordering that must be respected uh, be between the tasks. So the next idea I want to introduce to you is the notion of parallel loops. And in, in practice, this is really important because particularly in um, scientific programming, loops are the main source of parallelism in most of our applications. Okay. Not all of them, but the vast majority of applications, that's, that's where the parallelism comes from. And the concept here is very simple. It's just that if the iterations of a loop are independent, so it doesn't, in other words, it doesn't matter in what order they're done because we're going to get the same result, then we can share out the iterations between different threads. Um, so suppose we have uh, a, a loop like this, okay? So it's a, it uh, has 100 iterations in it, uh, and all it does is that it adds the elements of two arrays together. So those iterations are nicely independent. It doesn't matter which order we do those additions in. We're going to get the same result. So we could do something very simple. Uh, so we could execute the first 50 iterations on one thread and the second 50 iterations on the other thread. Uh, and that would be a way of executing this, this loop in parallel. Um, I should say here that, uh, you know, this is a very simple example. And in practice, uh, 100 iterations is way too few to be able to get useful speed up from in, on a real system. Um, if, we, if I had something more like 100,000 iterations, then I would have a reasonable chance of, uh, of actually seeing some performance improvement. Um, but it's a, you know, 100 gives us a nice, nice simple concept here. So in terms of what I just, uh, just introduced you to, we can think of a loop iteration or maybe a set of loop iterations as a task. So what we're doing here is if the iterations are independent, then we're identifying the, it, the, the loop iterations as independent pieces of, of computation, and we are doing some mapping of those iterations to threads to get our parallel execution going. 
Okay. So this question here says, um, would the size of the thread pool depend on the number of cores? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so typically what we would do is uh, you create a thread pool at the, uh, at the beginning of the program where we ensured this mapping, this one-to-one -one mapping between number of threads in the pool and the core and, and the cores. Um, so uh, that's, um, that would be the natural and commonest situation for, for, uh, for, for the best performance. So yeah, so typically we want to, we want to uh, create a number of threads that maps to the, the, the hardware execution resources uh, and keep that fixed for the, for the duration of the, of, of the program. Um, so we don't have to do that, but that's, uh, that's almost always the, the most efficient solution. And then we might have many, many more tasks than we have threads but the tasks get assigned to the threads by, by submitting to them to the pool. Okay, so the Last concept I'm going to talk about in this session is reductions. So a reduction is just a name that's given to um, an operation that produces a single value from mathematically associative operations such as addition, multiplication, maximum, minimum, uh, logical and logical or. Um, so addition is, is by far the most common use case, um, probably followed by maximum and minimum. Um, the other ones are, are, are rather unusual. But the simple example would, would be something like this. Okay, so we have a scalar variable B, which has the initial value zero, and then we have a, a loop which uh, iterates over the elements of an array and accumulates them in, into B. So that at the end, B contains the sum of the elements in, in A. So that's a really common programming pattern. And so we might ask ourselves, you know, how do we execute that such a thing in, in parallel? Well, we could say what happens if we shared out those iterations between different threads. And we made B a shared variable which all the threads had access to. Unfortunately, uh, if we don't synchronize the accesses to B, then we have the race condition problem. Okay? We have multiple threads trying to update the same shared variable, the same memory location without any synchronization and um, exactly the problem that I illustrated earlier on might happen. We're going to lose some updates. If we synchronize, so we allow only one thread at a time to update B, then we will get the correct result but we'll also have removed all the parallelism. Uh, and in fact, we'll have introduced some additional overheads for synchronizing the threads, which mean that the code will actually execute slower than it would have done on a single thread anyway. So that's not a good solution either. What we can do instead is to give every thread a temporary private copy of B. So each thread can accumulate a partial sum into its own private copy. Uh, and then at the end of the loop, those copies are added together to give the final result. So it's, it's a very simple idea, um, but that means a number of operations so if, you know, if, in this case, n is much larger than the number of threads, then most of the operations can proceed in parallel 
and then there's a small number of synchronized additions that need to happen uh, at the very end. So provided n is much larger than the number of threads, then we can exploit uh, a lot of parallelism and expect to get reasonable parallel speed up from uh, operation this. Okay, so that was um, the end of this uh, of the slides I had for for this session. Um, so uh, let me let me open up uh, for for any questions and uh, please go ahead and and type into the chat box. Okay, so the question is um, from, from Alvaro. Can, can OpenMP detect if hyperthreading is enabled? Um, and the answer to that is no, it can't. Um, so it, because there, you know, there is no way in that through OpenMP. You can't ask whether, whether hyperthreading is, is enabled or not. You just have to know <laughs> by, by some means or other. Um, enabling hyperthreading is usually a well. It's usually a boot time choice, uh, though on HPC systems, it's a you know, it's it's a choice for that for that job, um, because effectively what you're doing when you launch that job is basically doing a reboot of the compute node, uh, and at that point you can um, you can choose to enable or disable hyperthreading. Okay, it's a question from Jakob. So, I, yeah, I said that 100 is too few iterations for parallelism to make sense. Is there a general value from which parallelizing a loop makes sense? Well, that that depends on, obviously, that depends on how much work or how long each iteration takes to execute. Um, but as a rough rule of thumb for OpenMP parallelism, you need your loop to execute for more than a few microseconds to make it worth parallelizing. So the overhead of, of parallelizing a loop in op OpenMP is typically on, of the order of a, uh, of, of a few microseconds. So unless your loop is executing for more than that, it's not going to be worthwhile. Okay, yeah, suggestion from, from Suraj. Yes, you can compare the number of physical cores and logical cores to know if hyperthreading is enabled, but there, there isn't a way to do that in OpenMP. Um, so you can, uh, OpenMP has a function which allows you to ask how many physical processes there are, but that doesn't help, unfortunately, because depending on the implementation, that may return the number of cores or it may return the number of hyper threads and you don't know. So there's a question from Lennart. If you're running multi-threaded programming, should you stick to a single compute node on a supercomputer? The answer is yes, okay? You cannot uh, run multi-threaded programs across, across more than one node because there is no support for shared memory across more than one node. So say nodes do have shared access to a central memory. Um, well, possibly, okay. They may have access, typically they will have said access to some central disk, but, but not, to actual, not to actual RAM. It depends, depends on the system, I guess. <laughs> 
So would you have to exploit MPI to start a new set of open and pre threads on a second node? Um, yes, probably. Okay. If you want to run a single application across multiple nodes, then you would need to use T MPI, uh, probably to do that. Yes. Okay. That's true. So it's, it is okay to combine MPI and OpenMP in the same application. That's becoming quite a popular model um, for, for some large applications these days. Okay, a question from Miroslav says, since CPU raises a much smaller memory than compared to shared memory, is it possible to run a practically conceivable task which is too big for a single thread? So um, you need to make the distinction here between that um, it, it's the private data for a thread is not restricted to the CPU registers. Um, so that's uh, the that's the that that restriction is not is not the one that we we care about here. Um, so in other words. It's okay. So typically, a single thread will have access to all the memory on the system, uh, and just like any sequential program, it has to. It, it obviously has to cope with uh, with uh, loading and storing into the limited number of CPU registers. But that's no different from a sequential program. So I could maybe add a little bit to that as well. So the normal mechanism for threads to have private memory is for them to allocate that memory on the stack. So usually the, the usual way of organizing uh, private versus shared memory is that each thread allocates private data on, on its stack. Every thread has its own stack, uh, whereas shared, shared data is allocated in one heap, which, which all the uh, which all threads have access to. So in this example, so this is the reduction example. Okay, if, if B were an array, is each private copy is the same size as global B as a slice of it? Um, typically, if you are doing a reduction on an array, then every um, then every private copy would be the same size as as the global array. Yeah. If you just needed a slice of it, then most likely then you wouldn't need to have private copies because every thread could write independent parts of the of the of the shared array. Okay, so I think we'll this would be a good point to, to take a break. So uh, uh, I'll be back again in in half an hour at uh, at, at three thirty UK time to to start the, our next session. So I'll speak to you all soon. Okay, welcome back, everybody. So in this session, I'm going to cover some of the fundamental concepts in in, in OpenMP um, without really getting too much into the, the syntax yet. Okay, so I'm, yeah, I'm gonna cover the basic concepts, then I'll say something very briefly about the history of OpenMP, um, which has been around for quite a long time now and is, has evolved quite a lot since its early days. Uh, and then some practical stuff about compiling and running OpenMP programs at the end. Okay, so start off with, well, what is this OpenMP thing anyway? Okay, it's an API that's designed for programming shared memory parallel computers, uh, and it uses the concepts of, ta of threads and tasks that I introduced in, in the session before. And OpenMP is a set of extensions to Fortran, C, and C++, and these, extensions consists of three different types of things. So the main and most important one is compiler directives, which I'll say a bit more about in a minute. 
but there are also some runtime library routines and there are also environment variables which also form part of the standard as well. So let's look at directives to begin with. So a directive is a special line of source code which is designed to have meaning only to certain compilers um, or to compilers with certain features enabled which is actually more the more the common case these days and a directive is distinguished by what's called a sentinel at the start of the line so sentinel is just a special sequence of characters that tells the compiler that this is an openmp directive this line of code is an openmp directive uh, and not a line of source code in the underlying base language. So OpenMP sentinels are, so for Fortran, it's exclamation mark dollar OMP. And for C and C++, hash pragma OMP. So the way it's done like that is to ensure that OpenMP directives can be ignored if the code is compiled as regular sequential Fortran C or C++. So in Fortran, um, without OpenMP enabled, lines starting with an exclamation mark are treated as comments. And in C or C++, without OpenMP enabled, um, the pragma will be treated as an unknown preprocessor pragma and, and also ignored. So this, the reason it's done like this is that it is a convenience to help you write code which will execute correctly, either as a parallel OpenMP program or as a regular sequential Fortran C or C++ program without having two different copies of your source code. So although this feature helps, it doesn't guarantee that's the case. So you have to be careful not to, to write code in a, in a particular way that doesn't depend on there being a certain number of threads, for example. Uh, and then you also have to take care of if you use runtime library routines, then you also have to take care of those, um, for example, by conditional compilation. Um, to make sure that they are those lines are not not compiled if you don't want OpenMP enabled. But it is a useful feature, so it does mean that you can write code that will be parallel and sequential in the same source base without having multiple versions, uh, which which is which is a useful feature for software engineering purposes. Okay, so let's look at the way that parallelism works in, in OpenMP. And this is all done through a construct called the parallel region. So this is the basic parallel construct in OpenMP. And without a parallel region, then we don't have multiple threads and we don't have any parallelism. So all parallelism in, in OpenMP depends on using parallel regions. So the way it works is like this. Parallel region defines a section of your program. And an OpenMP program begins execution on a single thread, uh, which is called the master thread. So when you start an OpenMP program, it behaves pretty much identically to a normal sequential program. And nothing interesting in terms of parallelism happens until the first parallel region in the program is encountered. And at this point, the master thread creates a team of threads. So this is, uh, you know, technically speaking, this is a fork join model of parallelism. Um, if you know what that means, that's great. If you don't, don't worry about it. It's just a piece of terminology express this idea that you, uh, you that parallelism appears and disappears at various points through the program it's the, the program is not always parallel <laughs> 
So once we get into the parallel region, every thread executes the statements which are inside the parallel region. And that includes the master thread as well. So the master thread becomes one of the threads of the, of, of the team, uh, it creates the additional threads, and all the threads execute the code that's inside the parallel region. And then at the end of the parallel region, we have a synchronization point. The master thread waits at that point for the other threads to finish and then continues executing the next statement on its own again. So we can see this in uh, this diagram here. So on the right here, I have this uh, sketch of, so uh, in, in the middle is the, the Fortran version. So a parallel, I'll give you a, some preview of the syntax. So the OMP parallel and end parallel delineates the, the parallel region. So the parallel region is the code between those two directives. Um, for the C version on the right hand side, the, uh, we have a hash pragma OM, OMP parallel and then the block of code in the, in the curly braces that follows that directive is, is the parallel region. So we start off at the beginning of the program with just the master thread executing. So that's called the sequential part of the OpenMP program. And the master thread executes on its own until it reaches the first parallel region. So at this point, well, at least logically, it creates a team of threads. So in the timeline on the left-hand side here, I've shown a total of eight threads. So that's the master thread plus seven others. So all eight threads execute the code that's inside the body of the parallel region. And then at the end of the parallel region, the master thread waits for all the other threads to reach that point, to reach the end of that block of code. Once all the threads have got there, then the master thread carries on executing the next statements of the program. So now we're back in the sequential part again. And then we can repeat this process of creating a parallel region, having multiple threads execute it, and then closing it again. So this can happen as many times as you like during the lifetime of, a, of an OpenMP program. So you know, a long running OpenMP program might execute thousands or millions of parallel regions during its lifetime. So now we have the idea of what about shared and private data. Well, when we're inside a parallel region, variables can either be shared or private. And okay? so that behaves how you would expect. All threads see the same copy of shared variables and all threads can read or write the shared variables. And each thread has its own copy of private variables uh, and these are invisible to other threads. So a private variable can only be read or written by, by its own thread. Um, so at this point, um, so if you're a, a C programmer, then the thought might, might occur to you that says, OK, what would happen if, suppose I have a thread with a private variable, um, I take its address store that in a shared variable, allow some other thread to, to, uh, to reference that and dereference data and try and access. So that would allow a thread to try and access the private variable from which belong to another thread. So um, in practice, that would probably work, but that is expressly forbidden by the OpenMP standard. It would also be an awful thing to do from a code readability point of view. Um, so in, in practice, probably it would work. No guarantee that it would work. And your uh, OpenMP is very explicit saying you're really not allowed to do that. So if that thought did occur to you, then put it away now. OK, private variables are only to be accessed by their, by their owning thread.
So I mentioned that parallel loops are um, very important because they're the main source of parallelism. And so by default, in a parallel region, all threads are executing the same code. Um, so in order to make parallel loops convenient in OpenMP, OpenMP also has directives which indicate that the work uh, should be divided up between the threads and not replicated. Uh, and the term for this kind of, uh, so loops is one, is one way of doing this. There are other types of, uh, of dividing up work in, in OpenMP. Um, so the general term for this kind of thing is called work sharing. So they, these are the work sharing directives which appear inside a parallel region and they indicate that instead of the default, which is for every thread to execute everything, that this piece of code should be shared out between the threads. So OpenMP has pretty extensive support for parallelizing loops, which we will talk about next week. Um, so for example, there are a number of options to control which loop iterations are executed by which threads uh, and so on. However, it's important to realize that it's up to us as programmers to ensure that the iterations of a parallel loop really are independent. So there is nothing in the OpenMP compiler that, we, that is going to do any checking of that for you. Okay. So uh, I mean, you can get tools to do that. Um, some compilers do have some automatic loop parallelization facilities, but OpenMP does not make use of those. Okay. So it's completely up to the programmer to make sure that what you're doing is correct. That if you specify that a, if you specify an OpenMP a loop to be executed in parallel, then it's up to us as programmers to make sure that the iterations really are independent. And there is a restriction here, which essentially says that only loops where the iteration count can be computed before the execution of the loop begins can be can be parallelized way. Um, we'll talk more about that later and see how uh, we'll see, talk a little bit about um, how, what those restrictions are and and ways and ways of getting around that with using other OpenMP features. Okay, so in terms of synchronization, so remember that you know by by default, once we're inside a parallel region, the threads are executing that block of code independently and asynchronously. So in order to synchronize threads to make sure that reads and writes variables happen in the right order and to ensure that updates to shared variables can happen only by one thread at a time, there are some synchronization constructs. And OpenMP, the main ones are a barrier, so a barrier is a full synchronization point between all the threads in the parallel region. All the threads have to arrive at the barrier before any thread can proceed past it. So, and typically we use that for delimiting phases of computation. And in particular, there's an, the, we use a barrier at the end of parallel loops, which makes sure that all the iterations of the loop are finished before the threads carry over anything else. Um, second main kind of synchronization construct is called a critical region. So this is a section of code which only one thread at a time can enter. Uh, and this is, uh, this is exactly what we need if we want to do modification of, of shared variables. We want to make sure, we, so we don't mind, in this case, you know, this is a situation where we don't mind which order threads uh, update shared variables but we want to ensure that only one thread at a time can do it to avoid race condition type bugs. Uh, we can use a critical region to do that. Um, and then there's also a special case of this, which is called an atomic update. 
So this is this is specifically uh, whereas a critical region can contain any any block of code, an atomic update is specifically an update to a variable which can be performed by only one thread at a time. Um, so this is a special case which is uh, which is used for perform which is different from a critical region because of because of performance reasons reasons uh, and, and we'll uh, we'll I'll talk about the difference between those and and when you should use which uh, later on. Okay, so a little bit of history, a little bit of a history lesson. So when I, this is going back a long time now. So when I started in in, in parallel computing, um, there was a lack of there were a lack of standardization in, in this type of parallel programming. So this this style of of parallel programming has been around for a very long time. So this idea of using directives to, in particular, to annotate parallel loops. Um, but what happened was that every hardware vendor provided a different API. Every hardware vendor supplied their own compiler for their own hardware, a different way of doing this kind of shared memory programming. Um, it was mainly directive based. It was almost all for Fortran. There was very little support for, for C at that time. And that just meant it was hard to write portable code. Um, so the OpenMP forum was set up by a bunch of companies. Um, uh, so it uh, and that list has grown considerably. So the OpenMP or ARB now consists of around about 30 organizations. Um, so that includes all the major uh, hardware vendors, um, compiler writers, and also academic organizations. So including ourselves here at EPCC, but also some of the big, for example, the big national labs in the U.S. Uh, contribute to, to the to the to the standard as well as the uh, the hardware vendors and compiler writers. So the first standards were came out in in for Fortran in in 1997. So OpenMP is over 20 years old now, um, and the there was then a separate C standard which came out uh, which came out a little bit later. Um, so at this point there was so at that point there were two completely different standards for the two different languages um, so at that point those of us who were working on the standard realized this wasn't a really a great idea um, and so it was then combined into a single standard in uh, in, in 2005 then there's been various updates since then. So in particular, vers version three included um, some new features, particular tasks. Um, and then version four started introducing uh, other things which al allow you to offload code to GPUs, for example, which is also part of the OpenMP standard. I'm not going to talk about that in, in this course. It's uh, completely, you know, it, it's worth an entire course in its, in its, own, its, in its own right. So mostly what you will find in implementations that are around at the moment is version 4.5. Um, version 5 exists. That was released um, uh, a year or so ago. Um, but that's not typically supported in most compilers yet. So mostly, mostly you will see um, uh, 4.5 in, uh, in current compiler versions. So if you're interested in in uh, in looking further into OpenMP, so just a just a point as to some resources. So OpenMP has its own website, which is uh, openmp.org. Uh, so in particular, you can download the official language specifications from from there. Um, Say so that's good. The official specifications are quite like most language specifications quite complicated um full of 
full of specific terminology which uh, which you have to understand precisely how the language is being how uh, the, the terminology is being used and it's it's quite complicated but nevertheless if you want to go to the original source for the for the language vacations they are freely downloadable from from that site um, there's also links to compilers and tools and uh, and mailing lists. There's a there's a there's a forum there where you can ask questions, um, and uh, it's it's actually my job to essentially my job to answer questions on on the uh, on the main forum on the main forum list there. So if you have if you have questions, you can ask me directly. Um, but if you you know uh, during this the uh, obviously doing the, the this course but if in, in the future if you want to you can of course get in touch with me directly but if you ask on the open mp forum then you'll probably get an answer from me as well um, in terms of textbooks open mp is not hugely well served um, there are a pair of books which i would recommend so um, the first one is is called using open mp um, and that covers, that's now quite an old book, and it covers just the um, features up to version 2.5. Um, but that will, that, that, in, that does cover pretty much everything that I'm going to talk about in this course. We're not going to really go beyond that in, in, in these lectures. Um, there is a follow-up volume called Using OpenMP, The Next Step, which essentially covers up to version 4. Um, so that covers uh, other, thing, other new features which were added after version 2.5. So in particular, the accelerator stuff, the task features, and the SIMD vectorization directives as well. So just some, some practical stuff about how to use OpenMP. So um, these days, particularly in HPC world, OpenMP is built into most of the compilers you're ever likely to come across. So you know, compilers, so, so GNU compilers, Intel compilers, IBM, Cray, um, and uh, PGI, so you know all the, all the common compilers that are used on HPC systems do have OpenMP built into it. So to compile an OpenMP program, what you need to do is to add a compiler-specific flag to your compile and link commands. Um, so, for example, that's um, for GCC and G Fortran, it's minus F OpenMP. For Intel compilers, it's minus Q OpenMP. Um, it's actually enabled by default in Cray compilers. So there's then a, there's a, a compiler switch to disable it if you're using Cray compilers, for example, on, the, uh, on a Cray system. So that's the so that's the compilation process. Very straightforward. Just an additional compiler flag. The number of threads which you will be used is well. There are various ways of doing this, but the simplest, most straightforward, and commonly used way is to um, express this by setting a an, an environment variable before you execute your program. Um, so this this environment variable is is called is, the name is omp underscore num underscore threads. So that's uh, that's not compiler dependent. That's part of the specification. So that's the same for all compilers. Basically, set that environment variable before you run your program, and that then becomes the default number of threads for every parallel region in your program. So there are there is there are ways of getting more control over over thread numbers, and which we'll we'll we will talk about later on. Um, but by far, this is by far the commonest way of using OpenMP. Is you're going to use the same number of threads for every parallel region. You write your code in a way that is independent of the number of threads, 
So the number of threads is not encoded in your program. It's set as an environment variable, and then that's picked up when the program actually executes. So that means that you can uh, change the number of threads without recompiling your program, which is a, a really useful feature. And then to run an OpenMP program, you just run that in the same way as you would a sequential program. So that's typically just by typing the name of the executable on the command line, or, or if you're on an HPC system, just including it in your, in your batch script. So there's no, so it's um, for, for anybody who's familiar with MPI programs, there is no launcher program for OpenMP. So there is no equivalent of MPI exec or MPI run or MP run or, or whatever it is the flavor of MPI uses to, to, to launch an, uh, an MPI program. Uh, open, OpenMP programs don't need that. Okay. So uh, when you come to do the first exercise, uh, come to do the practical exercises, the very first thing is just to get yourself familiar with uh, with compiling and, and, and running. So um, it's basically a very simple uh, OpenMP Hello World program for you. So just get you to compile and, and run that. So what you can do is you can try using the uh, using the uh, OMP num threads environment variable to to change the number of uh, of threads that. Uh, that um, you will use. Um, so uh, you will get a, a number of threads by default if you don't set this. Um, that depends on the compiler that you use. If you use, as we suggest, the, the Intel compilers on Cirrus, then it will actually um, it will map the number of threads, OpenMP threads, to the number of hyper threads. So you, I think you will get, um, so the um, nodes on Cirrus have 32, 36 cores, each with two hyper threads. So you will get 72 threads by default, um, which may or may not be what you want. So um, it's, you typically always have to set the environment variable before running your program. Okay. So yeah, that's um, that's that's all I had for for this session. Um, so that's a little bit uh, finished a little bit earlier than, uh, than than I thought, but that's uh, that's okay. Um, so uh, again, I'll op open up the session for for any questions. Okay. So, the question is: OpenMP has directives which indicate work should be divided up between threads and not replicated. Um, okay. Can I can I elaborate, please? Well, we will cover this in later lectures, so don't worry if that's uh, if that doesn't quite make sense now. But the idea here is that um, the basic parallel construct in OpenMP is a parallel region, which defines a section of code um, by default that block of code will be executed by every thread. So the default behavior, if you have a loop inside a parallel region, the default behavior would be for every thread to execute all the iterations in the loop. So if you want to divide the, the if you, so that's maybe not what you want. Okay, if we want to execute a loop in parallel, we don't want every thread to execute all the iterations. We want to divide the loop iterations up between the threads. So we need some additional directives which appear inside the parallel region, which uh, mark up the parallel loops uh, in a way that says, okay, don't execute this on every thread execute it in a way where the, the loop iterations are divided up between different threads. So yeah, we'll, uh, we'll look at these, this type of, uh, these loop directives in, in detail next week. But, but I, hope, uh, I hope that gives you a, um, the, the, uh, a bit more about the conceptual idea here. Okay, so this is a question about, about threads. When we use blahs, can we use hyper threads for the block that are outside of Blas routine and single thread inside of Blas routine. Um, 
Okay. So using using Blas libraries in conjunction with OpenMP is a little bit complicated. Okay. Um, so because uh, you you can either use a sequential Blas library and call that from every thread inside an OpenMP parallel region. Or you can use a parallel BLAS implementation and call that from the master thread outside a parallel region. Um, and mixing and matching those can be can get a little bit difficult. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers the question or not. Yeah, so using parallel BLAS in conjunction with OpenMP can be a little bit complicated for, and that, that's because the, the, if you're using a parallel implementation of the BLAS library, that may not be using OpenMP threads inside. It might be using some other threading mechanism. And uh, depending on the compiler and the BLAS library implementation, that may or may not mean that the combination of threads playing those, you know, two different threading mechanisms um, work correctly together. It's possible to end up in situations where you can create, you end up creating more threads than you have cores or hyper threads, and, um, and you might not get the performance that you're looking for. Okay, so it's a um, C++ question. Does OpenMP support reduction of more complex type like structs or class objects if, if it have its operation plus overlo uh, overloaded? Um, so the answer is yes, but you have to uh, create your own reduction operators. So OpenMP has a mechanism which you can define your own reduction operators on objects or structs. So it doesn't, it won't automatically uh, work um, with uh, if you have the overloaded plus operation, um, but there is a mechanism to which allows you to define your own reduction operators. Okay, um, so and the question is in the hello world example, what does the pragma critical do? That makes sure that only one thread at a time writes writes out a value. Now. That's largely in there for historical reasons. So in the past, some OpenMP compilers didn't have uh, thread safe IO libraries and you could get jumbled up output. Um, I think these days you, could, you can probably safely remove the critical section and, and get uninterleaved output from most compilers. Um, um, this is a little bit of a, it's a gray area in the specification um, because uh, the OpenMP specification says something like, you know, all built-in libraries must be thread safe, um, but then it doesn't really define what thread safe means. And in fact, in general, there is no good sense, there is no general definition of what thread safe means. Um, so. Uh, that that's what it's there for. It's to is to to make sure that uh, that you really that your output really you do get um, uh, one line at a time from different threads, and you don't get uh, jumbled up output. Okay, so if you do think of other things between uh, between now and next week, then by all means go to the uh, um, the course chat page that um, so. Is, the link to that in the uh, in, in the in the email that came that was sent out the other day. Um, so follow that and and send questions to there, and I will uh, I'll keep an eye on that and uh, and answer any questions that that, that people have. Um, so if you if you are going to do the practical exercises, then please go ahead and get signed up on Cirrus and uh, log in and make sure that you can. Um, download the exercise code and uh, unpack it and run the hello world example. Um, so, and again, if you have any problems with that, please uh, please get in touch via the via the chat page, and uh, we'll do our best to sort you out. <laughs>
Okay, great. So if there aren't any more questions for today, then thank you very much for listening and I'll speak to you all next week, I hope.